Hello, everyone. Uh, here is Manar abdel -Majid. I'd like to welcome everyone to the leading phase of course at Egypt Scholars. Thank you so much for being here. The course has three sessions. The first two will be uh, followed by an assignment, which will be posted afterwards at the event page on Facebook. And I'm going to be your TA for this course. Um, please post any any questions that you have in the Q&A box at your at your right side, and the questions will be answered no, at the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and the questions will be will be answered at the end by by Dr. Bragger. So as you all know, Dr. Bragger is a leadership consultant and an associate professor at the Boston University School of Public Health. She had her master's and a PhD degree from in education from Harvard University. She has over 25 years of experience in leadership and management, and she also developed the Leadership Development Program, which was established in Egypt and was successfully applied in more than 45 countries. She has been in Egypt so many times as well, and she also taught at Menifea, the Menifea University in Egypt, and she is the lead author of an award-winning book, which is called The Managers Who Lead, and her new book is Leading for Results. It's with, it's with great pleasure that I present to you Dr. Joan Brother. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Menar. I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and okay. I'm, I'm happy to be teaching this course, and I'm glad all of you can attend. And to make it more interactive, please feel free to send a chat at any time and ask a question, and I'm, I'm very happy to be interrupted. As Minar is one of my students at Boston University, and that's how I got to know her, and I'm very happy for that. Um, so there is a question. When will it start? It's going to start now. Um, and uh, so I have been teaching leadership through my whole career. I spent the first 12 years of my career teaching it in the multinational corporations around the world, and I said, spent the second 12 years teaching it in Egypt and East Africa and also a bit in Afghanistan, mostly through ministries of health. And I learned a tremendous amount about how you focus on results and how leaders need to focus on results by doing that. So this introduction um, is to first give you sort of a point of view of how I think about leadership. Uh, the, but this is going to be a very applied course. The purpose of this course is to support you to lead better. Uh, wherever you are, if you're uh, in your personal life or in your organization, uh, we want you to become a more effective leader, and that's what the purpose of these sessions will be about. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you an overview of how I think about leadership. Oh, let's see if I can change this. Hmm. All right. Oops. Okay. So. The first thing I want to tell you is we believe you can learn how to lead more effectively. You don't have to be a, what they call a born leader with these traits, this certain kind of personality. You, no matter what your personality is, even if you're introverted, you can learn to lead more effectively. And that's what we do in all of our programs at Boston University around the world. We teach you the way you are to lead more effectively. Now, if you don't, most people, most leaders in the world don't have a formal training program. And how they learn to lead is this. They face challenges in their lives. You know that that's how people learn how to lead. But in order to get better, they get appropriate feedback and support to meet those challenges. And they get stronger and stronger. So to learn to lead, the way we do it is we have you focus on a challenge that you want to address. And then you receive feedback and support from others on how to face that challenge. So that's basically how we set up our courses if we do it in the university or in ministries of health. So that's what we're going to be asking you to do through these three sessions, to pick something that you want to learn how to lead. Okay. This is what we do believe when we're teaching leadership. We believe in the value of all participants, regardless of their organizational level or status. and we respect different their intelligence, their experience, their wisdom, um, and this is about your development. And we also believe people learn what they need to. When you get clear about what you're trying to accomplish and you have access to knowledge and skills, you actually can achieve the results you want. Um, and we, we will support you in this process to clarify your purpose, 
and give you feedback about your progress. Um, we also believe that knowledge must be linked to action, which is different than some university courses, which just give you a lot of theory. But we believe if you really know something, um, something occurs, action occurs. And we have a model for that called the results model, where you can use real challenges to help you move forward. Uh, we believe in the power of shared learning and discovery. We believe people actually do need to learn with other people and discuss and talk about these things. So in whatever ways you can talk to others, either by chatting online or in person, that helps your development. And we also believe that, and I've seen this all over the world, in the creative spirit of every human being, we all have the capacity to create. And we all have the ability to imagine and dream. And even in the most difficult of times, which I know, I'm sorry, I know that Egypt is in, it's possible to create a future. Um, Nar said, I, I have been in Egypt many, many times. I taught in Menafea, and I taught in Iskandraya, and uh, I worked in Adwan, and Kamambo, and as far south as Ferris. So I, I have been in Egypt in, and recently, right up to 2011. Um, and my heart is with Egypt. So when you're leading, here's the first thing. You don't lead just for a routine problem. And I'm going to try to distinguish between what is a routine problem and a challenge that requires leadership. So when a problem is routine, it's already defined. You know how to solve it. You don't need new knowledge. Uh, one person or one group can do it. And there's already a prescription in place. A complex challenge, um, you need to analyze the situation. The immediate solution isn't known. And you're going to need to learn new approaches and be flexible. This is very similar to what's happening in Egypt right now. You're definitely in a complex town. You have to do collaborative work with many stakeholders to reach the solution. Again, this applies to Egypt. And people are going to have to change their values and their ways of thinking and practices to address this condition. Now, I'll give you an example from medicine. For example, a routine problem is like a sore throat infection. You already know the physician can prescribe a treatment, he knows what it is, and the patient doesn't have to change much in terms of values or behaviors. A complex challenge is something, as you know, such as high blood pressure. Because in order to really realize a lasting change, a patient needs to change and adapt their values and behaviors. And, um, change some fundamental habits to make lasting improvement. This, is, this requires, uh, actually, in the case of the physician, the physician now has to become a leader of his patients, not just someone who prescribes the medicine. Um, so when leading this complex change, what you are doing is you're helping people first to understand you're in a complex challenge and think of new ways to approach their work. They need new values and new behaviors that are responsive. When people are stuck rigidly to outdated practices, um, they really, they don't function well in a rapidly changing environment. So really leadership is asking people to think in new ways. In some ways you're being the best kind of a teacher. You're asking them to reevaluate the situation and think in new ways. So leadership, the way I teach it, is not so simple as saying, here's the direction, follow me. It would be easy if it was just that. But in a complex setting, you need everyone thinking, and you need to be patient while they're learning. And this is the hardest part about leadership, especially when you're going through a very difficult and complex change. So um, I have a set of practices. Uh, as you saw in the pre-reading, you can, I wrote a book called Leading for Results, and you can get, you can download it. It's uh, an ebook. You can get it through Amazon or Barnes and Noble. And there are five practices. You have to know your purpose. And you have to know what you're here to do, and you know what is your purpose in this situation. What are you trying to get done? You need to be able to see a better future. You know, all of the good changes in the world came about because people could see something better than the current condition. And as difficult as the conditions are that you're in right now you're still going to need to see a better future. And then when you see that future, what is the challenge we're facing? What are the results we can accomplish now? 
how do we align all of the stakeholders and how do we help ourselves and others continue to adapt to change? So those are the five chapters in the book. Um, it's not a long book, it's really a short book and I have stories from Egypt there and Afghanistan and um, I'll talk about this later, but one of the things I learned from working in Afghanistan is after decades of war that you, it's very hard to destroy the human spirit. The human spirit is there even, even in these horrible situations. So um, if you can get the book, that will give you all of the exercises you need to do. Um, this is the results model. And by the way, um, please interrupt me at any point to ask a question. This is the results model where you move from purpose, what are you here to do, to vision, what do you see in the future, and then you choose a measurable result that you can work on to move closer to that vision. You go down to the bottom of the model, you see there's a current situation, you have to know where you are, and then over to the left you analyze your obstacles, and to the right you then take actions that address the obstacles. It's actually, it looks like a simple process because it's on one page, but it takes a bit of time and we're going to take you through that process. So here are the steps. It starts with clarity about your purpose, and today we're going to have an exercise to help you do that. And then we will help you create a vision of what success looks like. And by the way, you don't have to use this just for an organization. You can use this for your career or your educational goals. What does it look like when you get there? You can even use it for your health goals. What if you want to be healthier or lose weight or be stronger? What, what does it look like when you succeed? You identify one measurable result that will help you move closer. Um, you understand your current situation. Analyze the obstacles to achieving the results you want. And then choose actions to address those obstacles. At the end, we want to help you frame a question. At the end of this three-part seminar, and the question will read, how am I going to achieve this result, this specific result, in the face of these specific obstacles? That's the leadership question that we want to help you frame, okay? So um, between these sessions, when I'm not finished with the presentation, but there's going to be a video on YouTube where you actually get to watch me teach this class at Boston University, and that will help. And you will fill in your own results model and come prepared next week to discuss it. So that's the first presentation. And... Dr. Osama, are you going to help me set up the second presentation, the second PowerPoint? And if anybody wants to ask questions, why are challenges at the bottom? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, the reason why is uh, you need to do all of the work before you frame the challenge. You have to know your purpose and your vision. You need to clarify a specific result and an obstacle, and after you've done all that work, then you write the question. But it is a good question, why is it at the bottom? I could put it at the top of this design too, but I want to make sure people don't jump too quickly. So that's what I think. Uh, other, from, can we go back? To, yeah, we can, let me go back and show you. So at the bottom, there's this question, how are we going to achieve this result in the face of these obstacles? Um, and you have to go through the whole process to get to there. Okay, so now all the slides are loaded. So now, okay, I got it. Um, so the first thing on the challenge, any other questions? Please stop me at any point. Um, so the first part of this model is to know your purpose, and that's a pretty thing pretty large thing to ask of you, but we're going to ask you to think about this. As you're busy in your life and trying to accomplish a lot of things, what what is the purpose of all of this? Um, I have a question. Are there any models for how to write the vision? Yes, I promise you we're going to take you through how to write the vision. And also in my book are all the exercises, but I'm going to take you through several of them in this presentation. So for your purpose, um, is a nice quote. This is the true joy of life, being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. And that's what all of us want, really, from our lives. We want our lives to have served something greater than ourselves. 
Um, and then one of my teachers from MIT says, when I met him this year, he said, everyone has a unique intentionality that we're born with, but we need to keep cultivating and nurturing that. And that's what we're going to try to help you do in this process. What are you really here to do? Now, purpose is similar to the word mission. Sometimes we talk about what is the organizational mission. And a mission statement defines why an organization exists. Like we're here to provide health care for the poor. It's a statement. It's reason for being. Now, a clear personal purpose statement is going to help you express what you are bringing to the world and what you want to contribute. And I, I promise you that helping to clarify this is going to make your life a lot easier because you will focus on doing those things. Now, your purpose may already be evident in your life. Most of us are already living lives that bear some relationship to our purpose. Usually, however, we're not taking the time to reflect fully on what led us to this place. Right? Most of us are working very hard. We're trying to be educated. We're trying to have a career. We're trying to form organizations. But we haven't stopped to really clarifying the words, the purpose that underlies all these choices we are making. So we want to do that for you, just a little bit of clarity in your life. The benefit of knowing your purpose is that once you craft this statement and it reflects your true aspirations, your path will become clearer and opportunities and resources open that would not have appeared before. And your decisions will begin to operate in alignment with that. Your actions will become more focused. You won't do things that are off purpose. Now, of course, life is taking care of family, taking care of children, taking care of friends. You will continue to do all of that and focus on your purpose. And the clarity is going to affect the people around you who will be inspired to support you. So um, I'll, just, I'll just go back there a second. Just think about people you know in your life who have a clear purpose and how you want to help them accomplish that. And how when you've been clear in your life about what you're trying to do, other people are able to support you. So here's, now here's the, the reflection. And this is not, um, okay, I have, we have a question here before I tell you this. A goal-directed person may be looked at as a perfectionist. How do you share with uh, a vision with a team without, you know, it's a very good question, I just want to say, because I'm going to answer this question for a second. How do you be a person who is very directed and also bring other people along without um, threatening them uh, from their safety? Um, this is That is the challenge of leadership. They, they call that walking a razor's edge. How do you bring them forward far enough but not have them want to uh, get rid of you. This is, you're going to be in a constant, people who want to lead are in a constant challenge like that their whole life. If you have to move people two steps forward, get them used to being there, and then move again. If you go too far, too fast, you're going to lose people, and worse than losing them, they're not going to want to have you around. So this challenge of having people face the difficulties of the future and look at it and move. This is, for the people who are listening to this, this is going to be your job for the rest of your life. How do you move forward when many people are afraid to move forward? So this is a really, really important question. You need to be patient while they learn. You can't actually move faster than they can move. You have to bring them along. So when you're thinking about your purpose, you have to ask yourself, what truly inspires me? Now, I, I'm just assuming that all of you are in a situation where, you know, at this moment in history, caring about your country is very, very important. And how did this, what, what really inspires me? How did this reflect what I most deeply care about? And uh, this is, it, it helps to start to write this. There'll be other questions, uh, but let me tell you what you're trying to write. And, and, and stop me at any time and ask questions. Um, the purpose is a description of what you are intending to contribute. It, it captures in as few words as possible what you're doing when you feel you're, you're using your unique gifts and talents. What 
what are you here to contribute? Um, and to find it, if this is, I understand this is not an easy question to ask you. So um, the way I work with students in my classes, I ask them to think back in your whole life, your school life, your personal life, and think if you can find a time when you were happy that your own personal strengths and skills were being well used. Just a moment in your life, like a time when you were making a real contribution that wouldn't have happened if you hadn't been there. Like when I ask myself that question, sometimes I see an image of myself teaching. Sometimes I see an image of myself caring for my family. But a moment when I felt I was contributing. And, and even though this is difficult on this webinar, because I can't see your faces, to, to, to think. Um, uh, an example would be, so I think about a time when I'm teaching, and what I'm doing is I'm helping people to think clearly. And, and that's, you know, a purpose for me. Helping other people to think clearly is one of my purposes in life. How do I help other people understand? So when you see this moment in your mind, think about what you were doing. Were you with your friends and helping them to see the humor in something? Were you uh, writing a paper and thinking clearly? Who were you with? What were you doing? And in a few words, just write down what you were doing. Um, all right. <laughs> um, and to, it, it, this will take more than a moment. But that's the question I want you to think about. What am I passionate about doing? What am I contributing? Is it a way of caring for other people? Is it a way of thinking? Is it a way of bringing humor to situations? And it will be important to talk to someone who knows you. You can write this down and then say, I felt pretty good in this situation. What was I uniquely contributing? What do you think I was doing? Um, and then the way you would write your purpose statement, and, is, and, and by the way, we're going to have you do this as homework, and you can send it in to us. What I'm here to do is, and I'll give you my purpose, and I got my purpose actually 25 years ago I, in a leadership course. My purpose is what I'm here to do is actually to teach leadership. And I've learned that who I'm doing it with is I teach leadership to high performers who want to make a difference. That's what I do. I'm here to teach leadership to high performers who want to make a difference. So I, I need you to be high performers like you all are. And I need you to want to, you know, contribute in this world. And if that's who you are, that my job is to teach leadership to you. My purpose is to teach leadership to you. And I've been fortunate to discover that early. I didn't know that there would be work for me to do that, but then I went and found work. Um, but I'm always happy doing my work because I'm doing my purpose. So examples of purpose statements is I'm here to bring good analysis to complex situations. I'm here to bring laughter and joy to people around me. Uh, one person in my leadership course yesterday said his purpose was to tell good stories so people can understand uh, complex situations. He's a scientist, and his job is to tell a story so they can understand the science. So I want you to try writing a statement that captures what you're doing when you feel well used. And just just write out some draft, what I'm here to do, um, and and um, ask yourself, is it, does this ring true? So let's see, I have a question. I found my passion, but I lost it, and this has happened more than one time. Yeah, a lot of obstacles can, uh, yeah, you, but you know what, right? You know what, you got to, <laughs> I'm assuming you're young and I'll tell you, life is, you know this, people, life's filled with obstacles. That's sort of how it goes. There's no life without obstacles. And you're in a situation where there are enormous obstacles. And um, this is, 
this is your challenge. How can you stay on your purpose even in the face of the obstacles? And we're going to try to teach you some skills for staying on your purpose in the face of obstacles. But I'm I'm losing some of these questions because they're all coming now. So let me get to the let me go back to some of them. Um, but yes, that's the challenge. How do you how do you stay on purpose in the face of many many obstacles? Um, Okay, I'm just trying to get some more of these questions down. Um, uh, what if several things completely differ from each other? How can I find a connection that inspires me without? You see, that's, Dean, it's, that is the focus. We're asking you to focus. If you try to do everything, you won't accomplish what you want to accomplish. Um, uh, yes, it's being yourself. Can a statement of purpose Change from time to time. Yes, it can change. And um, my priorities and need to start over. Um, you could find a purpose that guides you through your whole life. You, it, I was fortunate that this teach leadership guided my whole life. Um, I found it when I was uh, in my early 30s, and it guided my whole life. Um, but in any situation, you could have a unique purpose, too. Um, so you can have both. You can have a purpose for the situation. You can have a purpose for life. You can have both of those. Okay. Um, let me see what I can do with this slide. So we want that's um, uh, we want you to try this. Um, now here's the thing about what a purpose is. Once once I got clear that I was here to teach leadership, it. It helped me. It's like a back of a ship. You know, the rudder, this little wooden thing on the back of the ship that you hold on to and it steers the ship. The purpose is like that rudder. It, it st actually steers you. Uh -huh. um, okay, wait a second. We're looking. There's a question over here. Hold on. Let me get it. Um, I'm trying to go up here a little bit on the chat room. Um, Yes. Um, yes, and if you talk about with friends, they all have their own thinking. And uh, there's a nice quote. I think it's from Gandhi. It says, when you talk to friends and they all have their opinion, don't forget to talk to that friend within and listen to that opinion, the friend within. Everyone has their own opinion. But if you want to have a very powerful life, you're going to need to trust yourself. So these purpose. It is even in the face of many points of view, you have to trust yourself. So your purpose could be embarrassing because it, who, you know, who am I to teach leadership? I didn't know how to teach leadership. I had to learn how to do that. It took me several decades to learn how to fulfill my purpose. Um, but they don't have to be very serious. Um, as you start to think about it, and please, you know, send these comments into us so we can reflect on them with you. What, what, you, it, it, it's just you're drafting. We're, we're asking you to write a draft purpose, if that makes sense. Any, are there any questions on this, on purpose? This is, this is part of the assignment after the first one to think about what are you really here to do? What, what have you been doing that you enjoy? When were you um, in a situation where it, you, it was helpful that you were there? And even for people who are quieter, when did it help to have someone who was a good listener? When did it help to have somebody who could provide perspective to the situation? Um, so any questions on purpose? We'll take questions. Um, so you can go back over the questions I've asked. You can look at uh, the questions in the book. And, you know, it's a, a funny kind of homework assignment. But we, I've, I have learned in teaching leadership that for a person really to lead effectively, they need to know what are they here to do. Maybe not in the big life sense, but at least right now. What are you trying to do now? Okay. Uh, how it says, I think reading results is coming 
He's coming from the ship with a, with a smile. Okay. So, um, any other questions? The purpose for building confidence. Yes. Mm, that's a good question. Uh, this is a, it's really a good question. What? Um, yes. It's, in order to lead, one of the things you're going to have to begin to do is actually believe in yourself and not be so worried about yourself. Don't spend quite so much attention on the question: Is are you good enough? Focus on what you're trying to accomplish. Don't don't look so much at you. Look at what you're trying to accomplish. You know, because who, who are any of us to accomplish something great? We're, we're just people. Um, uh, yes. So, yeah, so you'll take other people's opinions, but in the end, you have to follow yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, so listen to what everyone thinks, but in the end, have enough quiet time to know what you think. Okay, I'm going to, so that's purpose. I'm going to ask you to think about it, and uh, it's good to go back and read the whole chapter in the book and ask, there's a lot of questions in there. And feel free to send us, uh, Manar and me, a thought, and we're, we're happy to talk to you about it. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the third presentation, which is Envisioning the Future, which is slightly different than purpose. Um, uh, so I'll tell you what a vision is. Envisioning is actually, uh, this is a nice, quote from this uh, producer, George Lucas. Let me get that. Dreams are extremely important. I'll get the page. Hold on. You can't, you can't do it unless you can imagine it first. This is the human being. We have the capacity to dream. Um, okay, so I'm reading a question now. I guess the trick is to make a good balance between what I really need to do for myself as a purpose and what I have got to do to help people with. Well, I think a good purpose actually does serve other people. That's that's what I found. The purpose that will fulfill you is one in which you're in service to other people. I think that's what we're here to do, actually, in the end. I mean, after we're finished taking care of ourselves, how do we use our strengths and our intelligence and our abilities to serve others. So I, I think a purpose is about serving others. Um, and that's our families and others. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about vision. And please continue to ask us questions about purpose. Um, the word vision is often uh, misunderstood and misused. Many good organizations have vision statements and they say hey, we're going to be the best in the world at what we do. And so now it, we've overused the word and we don't know how powerful a role that a clear vision of the future can play for effective action. Instead of the word vision, I like to say the word envisioning, which is a verb, something we can all do. We don't have to have a formal vision statement. We can look into the future and see something. So envisioning, what it is, is creating an image in your mind, a vision of the future. This is different from knowing your purpose. Your purpose expresses why you do something, the reason why you or your current project exists. Envisioning, in contrast, this is what you in your mind's eye see yourself doing when you're carrying out that purpose. So. If my purpose is to teach leadership to high performers, sometimes I see myself teaching in a classroom, but lately I've been seeing myself doing this, actually talking to my own laptop and envisioning people around the world listening. So you are actually part of a vision I've been creating over the past two years, and this is the first time I've done it globally, talking to my laptop. And But I created that vision over and over again. I saw myself working with the laptop, I saw other people in their homes or their offices on their own computers having this conversation. So for two years now, I've been envisioning myself doing a global webinar. And 
thinking. So I created actually a visual image in my mind of what I wanted to see come into existence. And every time I teach visioning to a group, I do it myself. And that's how I keep creating new things in my life. I see this image. And believe me, when I first saw the image of myself, my laptop, and other people around the world, it wasn't a reality to me. It was just this picture I had in my mind. But you can't accomplish, you can't even begin, you can't start until you see the picture. So this is why it's a very powerful thing. Vision is the heart of imagination. This is, this is a precious gift that a human being has. We, as far as we know, we are the only one of God's creatures that has this ability. This is a precious gift. And it's one we need to nurture and use well. A vision of the future helps you to see what you want to create, what you want to bring into existence. This is different than problem solving. Uh, problem solving is just how do you get rid of um, conditions you don't want. Um, but you could solve all your problems and still not achieve what you want in life. That's the tricky part of it. So let me um, see some of these questions. Hold on. Um, uh, each day is an opportunity to cut off a bad habit and envision, see, a true value of X, determination to gather all our power to make our dreams come true no matter how slight our efforts. Yes, it's a continuous motion forward. Exactly. That's not, yeah. That. That. Exactly. Positive. Um, I just began to imagine. Oh, very nice. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, that's why I want you to see the videos, because the videos, you will see me teaching in a closed room. Um, but thank you for imagining that. I really appreciate that. Yeah, we can't do it unless we can see it. And this is not just driving out problems. This is creating new things in the future that don't exist yet. And uh, I'll tell you, I went too fast. Um, okay, we'll keep going. And please ask me any questions. Is vision? Oh, you oh you can see two years into the future. You can see a day into the future. So this is how envisioning works. First of all, we are always putting images in our minds. When we wake up in the morning, we start to imagine. We see ourselves getting up, eating breakfast, taking care of our family, traveling to work, meeting with colleagues. We see this in our mind before we do it. This is how the mind works. And all these activities start first as images in your brain. And once you see that image, you start moving into it in ways that will move you closer to accomplishing that. It's, it's, your thinking is trial action. You think it in your mind and see if you can accomplish it. Um, and by the way, we're not asking you to become dreamers. We know people dream a lot. We are actually going to teach you a process to move from vision to action. That's what so you, you need to come back next week because if, you, if we leave you here, you'll only have the dream, and that's not enough. You need to have action. Um, to behave in new ways, we need two types. We need to do two types of things. First, we have to see a clear mental picture of something that is better than what we currently have. You know, because otherwise we just get into habits and we stay in our old habits. So first we have to see something that looks better than what we currently have. And I'm blessing all of you in Egypt because you're going to have to really see far into the future to get this. You're going to have to see past this year and next year. You're going to have to keep seeing this future. That You know, similar to the way Gandhi saw it in India when he really saw, you know, the British out of there. You're going to have to keep seeing it. And then the second part that's very important is um, you have to participate in the process of analyzing the obstacles to getting it. The human being likes to think. We like to think. We like to choose our own actions. So we have to see where we're going and then begin to design how to get there. It's, we're not very good at being told what to do, we human beings. It's why... We don't like oppressive regimes. Um, what if my future is beyond my capabilities and I'm passionate about it? Well, this is a really big question someone's asking. Um, 
you know, I believe in also having realistic visions. I, you know, I doing things within your sphere of influence. But I'll tell you, people have imagined some pretty big things and worked their way towards them. It takes a lot of work to get towards something really big. You'll have to work every day of your life. But that's what passionate means. You wake up every day and move towards it. And we're going to give you some skills about how you put something out in the future and move towards it. Um, so people don't, we don't easily, we people, all of us, we don't easily change our behaviors when other people's solutions are imposed on us. Sometimes we don't even like suggestions, honestly, we really don't. But when we ourselves are involved in analyzing our situation and finding solutions, we are more ready. We, we, we only implement new behaviors. And the story I want to tell you, my book, the first chapter on purpose is all about Egypt. Because, you know, I went to work in Aswan in 2002. And the challenge I was given was um, low commitment at the front line of the healthcare system. The Undersecretary of Population gave me that challenge. And so we went out, and of course people are demoralized. They're working in a government system, and they're underpaid, and it's bureaucratic, and they're not actually asked to think about anything. Um, uh, I'm just reading something after what I see. Um, so, so you have to read this chapter about as one, because then we ask them, what are you really dreaming about? What do you really want? And so we're working in the health system, and I remember that the head nurse of family planning, as one said, I'm dreaming that all the women all have access to family planning. That's really what I want. And that, that was an image in her mind that she could see. And we saw, you know, women being healthy and raising their children and the children have enough food and able to go to school. So we started making these images, seeing it. But then they went to work analyzing what were the obstacles to accomplishing it. And if you read this during Aswan, they accomplished many, many um, results in the health system, including more antenatal care, more family planning, um, more immunizations, and even reducing maternal mortality after three years. And those were all grander than they thought they could do, but they had the vision, and then they worked steadily towards it. So I do want you to read this, because we tell the story about Egypt all over the world. So you, you yourselves should definitely read what we did when people had a dream and worked towards it. Now, they worked in teams, and they worked hard, and they worked over years. But vision plus action, that's what we're talking about. So listen. Images of bad outcomes can influence our behavior as well. Every day we do this visioning, but actually what we're doing is worrying about the future. You know, we imagine someone's going to think badly about our work and we become anxious. Um, and these negative images uh, don't usually bring out the best in us. Uh, so we you need to be careful. Now, there's a lot about negativity in this world, and there's a lot of negative thinkers in this world, and they're all around us, and you need to be careful about, you need to be careful with your brain. Your brain is a beautiful and important thing, and if you start to fill it with negative images all the time, you're going to waste your life, okay? You've got this one gift of life. We're trying to use it to the best of our ability to be as good as we possibly can be and contribute in this world. And we want to put these positive images in our mind and share them with other people, honestly. Now, of course, sometimes you have to worry about things. You have to be careful and worry about things happening. Um, for example, uh, you, want, you want images about getting hit by a car, make us more careful as we cross, cross the street. Okay, so sometimes you want to be cautious, um, but sometimes you can become paralyzed, preventing any forward motion towards our goals. And, you know, this American writer had this funny and sad quote. He said, most of my worst problems never happen, meaning he was so busy worrying about everything that could happen, they didn't actually happen. So. Um, so this is what I want you to ask yourself when you're visioning. 
uh, what outcomes do I want to bring into existence? So let me tell you, I've raised children, and I kept visioning, as I bet your parents have, positive outcomes for their lives. You know, I saw them going into school. I saw my children going to graduate school. I kept having those images in my mind. And, and eventually, they had those images in their mind, too, to create a future for them. Um, and so what is this positive picture? Um, uh, and how do you reinforce it by right? imagining this more clearly? And again, in, in my book, in the chapter on envisioning the future, there's exercises you can do. Um, uh, that will help you to do this. So you can ask, are you, are you in the midst of a change you feel someone else is in charge of, which many of us do. We feel powerless and we feel victims. It's just, you know, this is a very large and complex world and a lot of people are in charge of things. So what, in the midst of this, what future can you envision, one that inspires you and that will lead to results you care about? And and then, as I told you, we're going to get to what actions will be effective in moving toward that future. We're going to have to use our minds in this most difficult of circumstances. You know, what do you most care about? What do you want to bring to existence? What do you want to see as a result of this change? Um, so, the exercise that you can do is you, you first you create a purpose statement, and then imagine, take a few minutes to see a picture of your life a year or two from now. So it's good to look two years out because now we're not worrying about the problems right in front of us. Think, I want you to think two years from now. Um, yes, I, it, there is a good question. You know, Sometimes we think about the worst case. I, I, I've done that myself, and that eases some fears. But I'm asking you to use this wonderful imagination for something else. To think about, and, and so here's the questions I want you to take a minute and think about. So two years from now, this is just for your personal life. I want you to imagine and don't think about the obstacles or the limitations. I just want you to see your health and your fitness in an ideal state. Like if you saw a picture of yourself, and I always do this at the same time. What's see yourself an image of you? Like you know, you could be fit, you could be strong, you could be doing exercise, you could be healthier, you could be a healthy weight. Just what? How do you? See See, and let me tell you, I have done this healthy body, healthy weight, year after year after year. And it's really served me. I have to tell you, it's served me in getting older. I'll, I'll tell you, because I know this isn't the culture in Egypt, but I'm 60 and I go to the gym three times a week. Now, I don't go to a very difficult gym. I go to a gym that women go to. But I kept seeing myself being healthy. Yes, and yes, hoping to be accepted in a PhD program, a high-ranked university, that is a purpose statement. That is exactly it. Um, so see your health in an ideal state. I've seen my fitness. I've lost weight over many years. I keep always putting it in the vision. I don't always get it in one year, but I never stop having it in the vision to be healthy. I'm getting healthier and healthier as I get older, which is was part of my vision. My vision was to be a healthy old lady who can continue to contribute. But I have to have the vision and I have to take a lot of action. So how do you, you're young, how do you see yourself two years from now? Are you doing sports? What are you doing to be healthy? Okay, so that's the first question. And you can just close your eyes and see a picture of yourself like physically fit and strong. And then, you know, you're, you know, you're, it's your, your obligation in life to take care of this body. Um, oh, so can we write it now? Yes, you can do some thinking about this, and when you get the image, write it down. What, how do you see yourself? You're playing tennis, you're playing sports, you're playing football. You know, you're going to have to move your body for the rest of your life if you're going to be a leader. 
you're, you're just if you're going to accomplish all the things you want, you're going to have a lot to do a lot to stay healthy. It's just the way it is. All right, the second question I want to imagine is two years from now, I want you to think about one important relationship in your life. Just pick one for now. It could be any relationship. And so we're going to close our eyes and imagine this relationship in the way you want it to be. Just you see yourself in a place. Just you see yourself doing an activity together. It can be with a friend, it can be a loved one. Where do you want this relationship to be in two years? It can be with a family member, it can be with your parent. How do you want your relationship with your parents to be two years from now? But just see if you can see a visual image in your mind. Okay. And by the way, I always do this too. And finally, the last question, and write down a note. Um, yes, just jot down some notes to yourself. And the third question I'm going to ask you is to, um, all right, we're going to imagine two years from now and we're contributing to the world in the way you want. Now, I know many of you are scholars and students, and two years from now you may still be in school. But just see yourself two years from now doing what you really want to be doing. Get an image of that in your mind. Okay, I mean, I'm thinking about it too. And get the image in your mind what you want to be doing for your contribution to the world and take some notes. Write down a few notes. Or you can draw a picture if you have some ability to draw a picture of what you've seen. And share, share that with, when you can, to share it with another, or share it with us, send it to us. Yes, please send it. As Minar is saying, just send it. Yeah. Um, okay. And so that is the first vision exercise, and you can do that. Oh, the story I like to tell is in rural Afghanistan. We were in Bamiyan province. And a team of health workers were asked to draw a picture of what they envisioned for a better future. And they talked together for a while, and they started to actually draw a picture of healthy children walking to school on safe roads. They actually draw the children, the school, and the roads. And for these rural Afghans, all aspects of this vision were non-existent. The children were not healthy, the schools were not there, and the roads weren't safe. Um, so they had to begin to explore the obstacles and also see what was in their control. What could they change? And these were health workers, so they did have immunizations in their hands. They decided to move to their vision by increasing the number of young children who were being vaccinated against preventable childhood illnesses. But among the primary obstacles was that people in the village, first they had to travel many miles over bad roads to get to the health facility. But more importantly, the obstacle was many of the villagers did not believe in the benefit of immunizations. Um, so to address these obstacles, uh, the team began to send outreach workers to travel to the remote areas to educate the villagers, but especially they worked with the religious leaders to explain this. They won them over to see the importance of immunization. They trained the local leaders to be advocates in their village. And then these leaders, especially the religious leaders, encouraged the families to have the children be immunized. And the result was that um, they used this vision to empower them um, to identify both the results and the obstacles. And in just a few months, they increased the number of children being immunized from 10% to 60%. So this is how you use a vision, especially in a difficult way. Like, what do you want to see? You want to see healthy children. What is in your control? What can you do? So um, what we're going to ask you to do between these sessions, and we're going to open this for Q&A now for questions and answers, is to use your purpose 
in a future you envision to begin the results model. And think about your current situation. And we're going to do this next week, go into more depth on the results model. But what we want for this week is just for you to think about your purpose and think about your vision. And if you like, you can share it with us and we'll help you with that. You can send it to Manon. So yes, please do share with us. And now I think, Manon, we're going to move to questions and answers. So, you know, how do you want to manage that? Um, so we have we have some questions. Um, yeah. So first, um, someone is asking that sometimes reaching my purpose would be on the expense of people around me, like going ahead with my career might mean not spending enough time with my family. Yes, um, isn't that something? So she's um, so this person is asking that this. Wouldn't this alter my our purpose, which is making people around you happy? Yes, if that's your purpose, is making people around you happy, then actually part of your purpose is paying attention to the people around you. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, you know, the question you ask is one of the great questions in life and one that is not easily answered. It's more like a challenge question. Like, how do I accomplish my purpose in life and take care of the people around me? I, I know myself, all, you can't imagine, all through graduate school, I had young children, and all through my career, I was raising children. So I lived every day with this question. How can I accomplish, you know, this career that is important to me and also take care of my children and raise them well? I lived in that challenge my whole life. There was never an easy answer to that one. Every day, I had to ask it and, and, and answer it every day. How do I do the things that are important in my career and make sure my children are well loved and taken care of and developed and become good people? That's, that's a big challenge. How do I do this? So it's a question, not an answer. How do I do this? Yeah. And you will have this, for especially educated women, you're going to have this challenge for the rest of your life. And for the educated men, you're going to have this challenge too. How do I be a responsible father and brother and son and husband and accomplish the things I want to do? We're all living inside of that challenge. Yeah. So, um, great answer. We also have another yeah. question. Um, how can I continue thinking in a positive way and inspiring people despite the negative environment that we're living in? Also, that's literally a challenge question. And, you know, as you know, they've done experiments. There have been people in very horrible conditions. You know, um, Mandela in South Africa was in jail for 27 years in the most oppressive type of prison conditions. And so he did experiments with his mind. Could they make him, could they make him into a negative person? And, so he began to see, even if they were treating him inhumanely, could he still remain humane? And he started to treat the guards respectfully. And I don't know if you know the Nelson Mandela story, but at the end, the prison guards were some of the biggest supporters of Mandela anywhere, because this man never treated people disrespectfully, even though he was treated inhumanly. So yes, you're surrounded by negativism. And it is now your job to become someone who can lead in the midst of that. So, um, and if you, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and run, listen, they say, don't run away from, don't listen to negative people. And we're sure there are many. Yeah. And, um, someone is asking about also that talented model. I think, I think it's, um, it would be better if we can if we can go back to the challenging model and um, try to apply like an example, or like okay. for instance, like the fitness example, if we can apply that to the challenging model, I, th I think this will be helpful. Okay, let's go find the model. Yeah. Okay, there's the model. So I'll do it from the top. So my purpose, well, my purpose is to teach leadership. Okay, but it's also to be another one of my purposes is to be fit and healthy so that I can continue to teach. 
I mean, I, I'm serious. I want to teach at least another 10 years, if not longer. So that requires, so my vision I have, I literally see a picture of, I, I, you know, I have even cut out photographs of older women speaking at, you know, lectures. I cut out pictures like that. I want to see these strong women in my mind's eye. So my vision is strong women being, you know, healthy and productive. I see that in my eye. So then we go down to the result. Well, I create lots of results, but um, let's say I, I want it to be measurable. So without sharing, I want to be at a specific weight this year, okay? So I go down to the bottom. I'm at this weight. And then I say, well, what are the obstacles? Well, I'm busy. I don't have a lot of time. Um, good food it takes. You have to spend effort on it and all. So all my obstacles are, it's really about time and prioritization of healthy activities. So over here, my priority actions are, I go to the gym three times a week. I, I just, I have to tell you something. I just came from the gym before doing this, and I had to rush home to get to do this. But on Saturday mornings, I go to the gym. That's what I do, no matter what. I just do it. So another action would be, I, pl I actually plan my food every day in the morning. I know what I'm going to eat for the rest of the day, and I make sure I have vegetables and fruit in the house, which you have to do if you're going to eat healthily. And I, even if I go to eat out, I'm extremely careful about what I eat. I don't just eat anything. So if I want to get, if I want to do my purpose, which is teaching leadership and being healthy and vital, and I see this healthy old woman walking around teaching, and I know the result is I need to be at a certain way to do it, and I'm at this way now. And the obstacles are I, you know, have I'm busy. I have lots of things in my life that have to get done. So if you go down to the bottom, the challenge statement, how am I going to be an optimal weight in the face of the obstacles that I'm a very, I have a busy life. I, you know, I'm a professor. I'm a consultant. I do a lot of things. I'm also... I'm a grandmother. I spend one day a week watching my grandchild. And this is the answer to this question people ask. In the middle of this purpose of teaching leadership, I had my first grandchild born this year. And all of a sudden, I realized that the most important thing I could do with one day a week was spend it with that boy. And so uh, my daughter works. She works four days a week. And one of those days, I go and take care of that child because who else am I going to teach leadership to but my own grandson? So, yes, you're going to have a balanced life, and you're going to have your own. You're going to choose your own priorities. So, how do I achieve the result of optimal health and weight in light in face of the obstacles, which is I'm very busy that I have to overcome. So every day I have to wake up and make a plan. How do I get to the gym? How do I have healthy food? How on days when I don't get to the gym I take a healthy walk? I have to do all these things because I'm telling the truth. Here's where I want to be. I want to be up here optimal. I am not, my current situation, is I'm not optimal yet. I'm certainly, every year I get better. But how do I do that? Now, I could become, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty happy to have my great child. Um, he's a wonderful boy. So um, I could become demoralized. I could become a victim. I could say, well, as you get older, you just get less healthy. That's what happens. But I'm sort of purpose-driven and vision-driven. There's something I want my life to be used for. So I have to identify the obstacles and choose some actions. Now, I'm not heroic. I'm not a hero. I just put a few actions in that are in line with my purpose and my vision. That's all I do. So that's how you use that results. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so this is a great example. Um, we also have another question um, from Amr. He's asking, what is the difference between managers and leaders? Should, it, shouldn't yes. they have the same perspective? Well, you know, this question is asked a lot in my field. And um, I have a model that says that uh, you need to both manage and lead. I don't think some people are managers and some people are leaders. I think that if you want to accomplish a result, you have to do certain things that are leading and certain things that are managing, and, and that's what's true. I don't I don't like that distinction because 
that sort of makes it look like a manager is someone who has no vision and a leader is someone who is not practical. And I don't think that reflects the people I see. I think if you want to accomplish something great, you have to lead and that you have to have purpose and vision, but you also have to manage is you have to have a plan and you have to have actions and you have to implement and that's managing. So I think you need to do both if you want to accomplish something great. What what other questions are there? So does anyone have um, any more questions or wants to share their vision with us? I, th I think Dina wants yeah. to, to, to share her vision. Yeah. Um, yeah, she answered the first question. She said um, that she, she, she can imagine having a healthy life, like r running or playing tennis every week. Exactly. So this, doing this, having visions of the future is optional. You don't have to have visions of the future. You can live your whole life without a vision of the future. But then you are going to be subject to other people's plans and goals. You actually, if you want to leave, you want to start to create your own future. That, that's what leading is. And then we teach you the skills of bringing other people along. But you have to know what's important to you. Um, someone else said that he's thinking of, um, he is also focusing about his health. And yes. um, that he doesn't want to want to smoke anymore. Yes. from now on, and yes. to keep himself and his body safe, and to bake. <laughs> and to bake. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing that you don't want to smoke anymore. What they learn, what they know, the research says, um, I, someone is playing Pilates, which is very good. <laughs> but the research on smoking says this. If you tell people, if you smoke, this bad thing and this bad thing and this bad thing are going to happen. It does not change behavior, okay? But if you help people create a vision like, do you want to live to see your grandson graduate from school? Yes. When they start to have a picture of something they want to accomplish, that helps people to stop smoking. So. If you want to stop smoking, your, your purpose is, you know, you want to be a contributing person to your society in some way. You're going to be a doctor or a lawyer or you will participate in politics, but you're going to contribute to society. And your vision is you see yourself contributing in that way and being healthy. So let's just take one measurable result at a time. Let's say I'm smoking zero cigarettes a day. You have to tell the truth. The current situation is I, listen, when I stopped smoking, I was smoking 20 cigarettes a day, okay, when I stopped. So I was smoking 20 cigarettes. I wanted to smoke zero. What were my obstacles? Um, I was addicted to nicotine. That's a pretty bad obstacle, let me tell you. I had a habit that every time I drank a cup of coffee, I smoked a cigarette, okay. Oh, I see some people sending their visions. Um, these, these are the obstacles. You know, I had very strong attachment to these cigarettes. Um, but actually, I had a vision that got me out of smoking. My vision was I wanted to have children. And I know that it was only that vision of healthy children that enabled me to take the actions of just putting those cigarettes down. And that's a difficult thing because, by the way, that nicotine is more addictive than heroin. That's an addictive chemical. You're not even allowed to sell nicotine in America. It's illegal. Nicotine is an addictive drug. So you have to have something you care about very much, your health, your contribution, your professional work, that is greater than that obstacle of that habit. And then start to take some actions so that you can go from 20 to zero. That's how you stop smoking. Okay. So someone who's got a scholarship can back to Egypt with a highly seen specialty and start a career. Of course, you have to see these things. Everyone who has accomplished these things has to see them first. They have to imagine them happening. So we have we have also another question about um, who are the yeah. people that you think were um, the perfect leaders or who are like examples for that great? Uh, leadership that we can learn from. Isn't that great? That's, that is great. Well, here's the thing about perfect leaders that you should know. If you knew uh, Gandhi or you knew Mandela, you would know they weren't perfect people. If you knew them personally, you would know their shortcomings. So we we have an image in our mind. I'm trying I'm trying to get somewhere. 
we have an image in our mind that these people are above human, but they are not above human. What they did, the people who accomplished great things, I'm trying to go back to um, uh, the very first slide. You, these people who accomplish great things, uh, they have great purposes, and they're willing to sacrifice to accomplish those purposes. So, in, actually, when I'm teaching this, I ask you, who in your life do you know that empowered you to face a challenge and achieve a result? I mean, who... Who did that? Did you have a teacher? Did you have a parent? Did you have a, um, a professor or a manager? Somebody, you actually know somebody who does this, who's not famous in the newspaper, but who actually really encourages other people to face the challenge and achieve a result. So look, look around you. And you can have, a, a, like, I like the question, can you have a multifaceted vision? Yeah, there's many examples of scientists who are writers. Right, right? You can see them in the world. You have to work very hard to do that, but you can do that. How can we have all this data and still not understand collective human behavior? Well, there's a, therein, Muhammad, lies a great question. You know, it's, I don't think knowing is the answer. I, 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 I don't think knowledge, we, we have all the knowledge. I don't. I think there's something greater than knowledge. Um, and I can't answer what it is in a word, but this, this you, you know, this human being is capable of great good and great evil. It's just the nature of this. And it's cho choosing the good is our, each of our lifelong challenges. It's, uh, we can't even talk about other people. Each one of us has to choose the good. What about, what, tell me, Mana, what you're talking about. Yeah, um, someone asked about the BMOSA. Um, I'm not sure what it means. I, I'm I not either. Yeah, okay. So, uh, Muhammad Sadi, would you like to elaborate more? I'm not sure if he's there. That's okay. So yeah. is, are there any other questions? We're in the last few minutes now, so if you have a question, uh, write it to us, or um, there's going to be a video that Minar is going to post for you to see of this class being taught, so you can see me and see me teaching the class. And there's a three-minute video and there's a 47-minute video, both, that you'll get the post for. And you can, over the course of this week, between now and next Saturday, Send us, you know, just your first draft. What do you think your purpose is? What do you think your vision is? And be sure to come back next Saturday because we're going to, you don't want to be left at the vision alone. Oh, vision, mission, objective, strategy, and action plans. Well, that's the results model. There you go. It's similar. It's uh, this VMOSA is vision, mission, objective. It's a very simple, what we've tried to do with this results model is take the best of everything we know about organizations and put it on one page for you to work on. So that's what this is. The objectives would be like the results, the strategies, or like the actions that address the key obstacles. So we tried to put this on one page for you to work through. Uh, we so, had, yeah. Yeah, we, ha we, we had one more question. It's kind of a yes. difficult question. So um, how to know that you're having a successful relationship? Does it depend on how many members you have in your life, or does it depend on um, what what exactly like defines a successful relationship? Of a relationship? Yeah. So you're talking about a personal? I don't think so. A personal relationship? Uh, like having having successful life like, relationships with the people around you. How oh, do you define well, it? and that's it. Well, therein is the question you also are going to ask yourself the rest of your life. How, how do you define, you know, God willing, you're going to go on and have many relations and hopefully children and family, and you will then spend the rest of your life working on making those 
successful relationships. And I, I know you're asking for a definition. I I enjoy my relationships with my children who are adults because I support them in their purposes. I try to be loving towards them. I try not to be critical. I honestly do. Very hard thing for a parent, but I try. Um, so throughout your life, you and and they can come and tell me things. They share their lives with me to some extent, not everything, I don't think, but what they want to and need to. And I'm in a regular loving relationship with them that are grown and other people in my life. Uh, this is a question you're going to ask the rest of your life. How is that person getting something from me? Am I getting something from them? Are we being loving and supporting of each other? So that's the best. You know, I, I like that Ahmed says it's a gift from God. From inside ourselves, this is really what we're talking about. And Rhonda says, if you envision a future of yourself influencing others in some way, when do you think it's time to envision? Oh, it's, it's a very hard question. You you can change the picture, and you, what you're going to learn as you go on. It's how do you influence others effectively. You're going to spend many years learning how to do this. You want to share your vision with others, see where you want to go, but you also want to hear their vision of the future, too. You want it to be a shared vision. Where do you see we could go? That's the best question you could ask if someone else is, what do you want to accomplish? Not just always be telling them what I myself want to accomplish. So we're going to learn to influence others without being dominated or trying to impose our visions on them. We, we want to build shared visions with other people. Any other questions? Thank you, Howard. I appreciate it. Well, I, I do want to say thank you. I've enjoyed doing this. You all are part of my vision that I can teach from my home to people who are far away and share with you what I know and make a contribution to you, inshallah, to the best of my ability. And um, have you engage in these questions and begin to use them to ask other people these important questions. And I really welcome you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, all of you, thank you very, very much. It's very kind.